I said last week that uh, near the end, like I, I had uh, something I wanted to say about the woman caught in, the, in adultery in John chapter 8, so that's what I'm going to endeavor to, to preach on today. It could get comprehensive. I don't know. but uh, So let's just read it first. Uh, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them, and the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So I'm going to qualify right off the bat. I do not for a moment believe that this, the statement, Go and sin no more, means that she could go out and commit adultery again. I don't believe the go and sin no more is in a general reference to belief or the sin of not belief in a general sense. I believe that when Jesus told this woman, go and sin no more, it means go and commit adultery no more. And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus, this is a hidden mystery, like a hidden parable, confirming and describing God's operation of writing his laws on the table of our hearts. So again, I'm just going to break down the figures, the types, the shadows, the imagery, the symbolism, whatever you would like to call it, the spiritual discernment of this. Okay, the scribes and the Pharisees, of course, represent those who were handlers of the law. And it is true, the law will find you guilty of sin. It'll describe the very act and say, you're guilty. And people who are judging simply by their own carnality or by a religious spirit can take the law and find people guilty. And so that's what it represents. The law uh, finds you guilty and it'll take you in the very act. And so Moses says, uh, we should stone her. What do you say? This they said, tempting him. First of all, they weren't interested in the welfare of the woman. They weren't interested in her salvation, or her perfection, or the glory of God. You know, that, that's not what their interest was. Their interest was tempting Jesus. Let's see what Jesus is going to say, if he's going to line up with our, our law and our thinking. Of course, he didn't. But the Bible says, Jesus stooped down and with his finger. So that's the first thing to note. This is very significant. He didn't write with a stick. He didn't write with a pen. He didn't write with a pencil. He didn't write with a hand. He wrote with a finger. So, you know, I'll, I'll review and revisit the ideas of the uh, handwriting of ordinances versus the Ten Commandments written on stone because those two issues come into play here. So, first thing is that he wrote with his finger. Okay, so let's stop there and re revisit and remember. And I know you've already heard this. Uh... But for the sake of those who may hear who haven't, uh, Colossians talks about Jesus Christ taking the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. It was a handwriting of ordinances. And handwriting was something that Moses did. God gave a bunch of statutes and commandments to Moses. Moses wrote them down. It was the, the handwriting of Moses, and it was... Uh, given to the people of God, and Moses was the mediator between the people and God for those statutes, for those commandments. It involves instructions concerning the feast days. It involved instructions concerning tithes. It involved instructions concerning 
the controversies between brethren. It, it was a handwriting of ordinances. That's what was nailed to the cross. And I'm saying not the Ten Commandments because you have to make a distinction between that handwriting of ordinances and the Ten Commandments and the uh, issues of importance of distinction with the Ten Commandments is that the, in the Ten Commandments, the Bible says the writing was the writing of God. And the work was the work of God. And it was not written with a hand. It was written with the fiery finger of God. That was the Ten Commandments. It was a fiery finger of God. So then you go to the New Testament. What did Jesus say? Oh, the Pharisee says, Oh, by Beelzebub, the prince of devils, he casts out devils. And this incident becomes an issue to bring up the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Jesus says, Oh, really? By Beelzebub? He said, Well, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, who do your children cast them out by? He said, But if I by the finger of God cast out devils. So the finger of God, he's saying, is the power of the Holy Ghost. So the Ten Commandments were not written by Moses. They weren't written by handwriting. It wasn't the work of a man. It was the work of God. It was the writing of God. It was the finger of God. And a finger is not a hand, and a hand is not a finger for the purpose of this teaching. Right? So they're distinctive. So don't tell me, Colossians, the handwriting of ordinances was nailed to the cross don't tell me that you, God took the Ten Commandments, nailed it on a cross, and took it away, because He didn't. He said, Heaven and earth shall pass, my word shall not pass, not one jot or tittle from the law. The Ten Commandments, the law, the law of God, that was the work of God, the finger of God, the Holy Ghost. Not one jot or tittle of that is going to pass away until all is fulfilled. The last time I checked, all hasn't been fulfilled. So the law is there, the Ten Commandments. That law of God. So first you have to know that distinction. And then of course now we're expounding that the finger of God is the Holy Ghost. The finger of God. The, the digit of identification. If I want to point somebody out and I want to point them out with a fleshly demonstration. I'll take my finger and point, right? Okay. What's the Bible say about a wicked man teaches with his finger fingers? And we, we've expounded this. It's not the pref preference, it's not the preference of God to, to use the putting forth of the finger, to zero in on individual identities. It's the Holy Ghost. When he has come, he will convince the world of sin. The convincer of sin. In the preference of God, I mean, sometimes you got to zero in on sin. I'm sure in times of danger and peril and souls in danger, sure, I guess sometimes you got to really pin the tail on the donkey or whatever you want to say. But the preference of God is that the Holy Ghost brings to conviction. Why? Because we're talking about that issue of worship where God wants the individual to, to repent in an act of worship towards Him and He wants that motion and action of repentance to come from an individual heart towards him and he doesn't want anything else interfering with it so it's completely pure between the soul and god it's pure no it, it really is an issue that you, you don't want to be repenting because i as a man tell you to repent you're going to want to be, repent because there's a conviction in you from the holy ghost now preaching will support the conviction It'll maintain the sense of godly fear. It, it's, it'll support the operation of God. But what I'm saying, as a preference, then the Holy Ghost is the, the finger, the convictor. So, it's very significant then, back to the story that Jesus stoops down, and what does he write with? His finger. He writes on the ground. He writes on the ground. He writes on the earth. That represents your heart, the ground, the earth. You know, the parable of the sower, we always go back to that. A sower went forth to sow, he sows seed on the ground. We preach the word, it falls upon your ears, it sinks down into your heart. And then there's a response, there's a reaction. The word of God can find a place in your heart and it can begin to grow and come forth and all of that. It has the potential. Or the birds of the air can come and snatch the word. Or it can fall among thorns and get choked out and we know all that about the parable of the sower. Nevertheless, 
Jesus, is, with his finger, is writing in the ground. And so, this whole issue of the woman taken in adultery represents the church who, when they commit any sin, they are in adultery towards God. We're caught in the very act. The law catches us. The religious spirit may catch us in the very act. But there's something hidden in here where Jesus first stoops down. He takes his finger and he writes in the ground. And when he writes in the ground, what he's writing is, is thy sins, thy sins. Now, we all want our sins to be forgiven. And Jesus in various places says to various people who reach out to him in faith, uh, the man taken with the palsy let down in the house, and then the woman who uh, washed, her, washed his feet with the tears and wiped them with her head, and, and others, he would say, thy sins be forgiven thee. So there's two aspects of God's finger, the Holy Spirit, writing on the tables of our heart. First, he's writing down thy sins. Thy sins, he's showing us our sins. All right, and what does the Bible say? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, he stooped down and wrote with his finger on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself. He lifted up himself, showed his glory, his righteousness. And he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground the second time. So what I'm expounding here is that this is a little picture. It's an allegory that God, by the Holy Ghost, he's going to write on us with his finger. First thing he writes is your sins. Okay, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest and even on unto, unto the last and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So we know that, if you remember some of the things I, I taught earlier in other messages it involved a twofold thing where God has a two stage plan for perfection. We have to start in humility, start in, uh, in the sinful state, and be redeemed out of it and be saved out of it to appreciate the consequence of sin by virtue of our personal experience with sin. So we have to start in the humility, we have to start in the fallen state and be redeemed and transformed into the spiritual. Starting the natural, be transformed into the spiritual. And we expounded that as a necessity. It had to be like that because Lucifer started as spiritual, he was created as spiritual, no experience or appreciation of the consequence of sin or turning from God so that when iniquity was found in him, and it was always there, but when iniquity was found, and when it was finally exercised, when Satan finally said, I will, he was a spiritual, eternal creature. And as we defined it before, the eternal spiritual sin has the eternal spiritual consequence. Which means, once you are spiritual, you are in the realm of spirit and eternity, when you transgress, the consequence is also eternal. So Satan can't be redeemed. Neither the angels that sin, they can't be redeemed. So what God is doing with us is he's starting us off first as the natural, the fallen state, redeeming us, converting us into the spiritual. And through the, that operation, and it involves affliction, it involves suffering in your flesh in order to learn from ceasing from sin, and we've been covering that stuff too. And through all of that operation, our hearts are instructed and prepared and told basically God is inscribing by him by his finger by the Holy Ghost on the tables of our heart why it is the imperative why it's so important why it's essential that we cannot commit iniquity we've heard brother Stair said not one iota of iniquity can enter the kingdom of God right there can't be anything enter into the eternal realm that is remaining with the potential to act its will independently of God, turn from God, it can't be. It will just defile everything. 
So it has to be this way. And it involves God writing in our hearts in two stages. It's two stages. There's a, an issue of that, that we have experience in the flesh, our encounter with sin, and God convinces us that we are in sin. Those are sins. And then, of course, that is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. When we, we come to Christ, God is going to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's the second part of the writing of God. Okay, let I'm going to go to uh, Deuteronomy. So that's the significance of Jesus with the woman caught in adultery, stooping down and writing twice, writing twice with his finger. And Deuteronomy 28, it shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle. The increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep, blessed shall be thy basket and store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. And he goes on, Lord, to cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. It goes on and on. Okay, then later down in the chapter. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, all, that all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, rebuke, and all that thou settest thy hand unto do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. He'll make the pestilence cleave, and he'll consume you from off the land, smite you with consumption, fever, inflammation, extreme burning, sword, blasting, mildew, on and on. The heavens shall be brass, the earth under you shall be iron, on and on. You'll be oppressed. Thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropes in darkness. And I'm just picking and choosing here. You get the idea. So you have a blessing and you have a cursing, a cursing and a blessing. And then finally, after he goes through all of that, in Deuteronomy 30, it finally says, And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind. Among all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. He goes on, and, the, and God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and so on and so on, and he'll multiply you. And he'll circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And he'll put the curses upon your enemies and them that hate thee, and thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord to do all his commandments which I command thee this day. So what the point of all that is, there's no way somebody can say, well, I'm just going to make sure I never do anything wrong so I never inherit the curse. <laughs> Because the part, of the, the part of this twofold plan is you have to know the blessing and the curse. Yeah. There has to be a demonstration of blessing. There has to be a demonstration of cursing. Again, by virtue of something you experience, goodness and severity of God. Then after all of that, after both these, those, those things come upon you, now you've tasted both, right? Taste and see the Lord is good. And you can see that the taste of sin and uh, is death and torment and alienation. You, you taste of death. Taste and see the Lord is good. The taste of death. The taste of life. You, you've seen them both. You've experienced them both. Now, choose life. Now, yeah. if, if, you, if you will call all that to your, your mind and then return unto the Lord, then I'll gather you. I'll restore you. See, there, there's two writings there. There's two writings. Just like the woman, there was uh, uh, caught in adultery. There was two writings. He stoops down and he writes with his finger. The finger of God is the Holy Ghost. He writes on the ground, on the table of the heart. 
So what is, uh, and we talked about the distinction between the Ten Commandments and the handwriting of Moses. Moses' ordinances were handwriting. They had to do with feast days, tithing, circumcision, um, and um, um, statutes concerning behavior and issues between the, the people of God. And Moses was the mediator of that. And uh, that was not the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were never nailed to the cross. That handwriting of ordinances, because the Ten Commandments were not handwriting. They were the finger of God. They were the writing of God. They were the work of, of God. Distinctive. Ten Commandments stand. Ultimately, the goal is for the Ten Commandments as a description of the divine nature is eventually to be fulfilled in our bodies when Christ comes forth. After we taste the blessing and the curse and then call it to mind and come to a true place of repentance. So, in the operation of God, it's like everything else. These things I write unto you that you sin not. So what's the mindset? What mindset do you start with? What's what mindset do you carry all the time? God does not want us to sin. We do so. We are not going to deliberate sin. We're not going to try to sin. We're not going to be make provision for sin. And if we should fail or whatever, if that's the part of the operation of God, then that's one thing. But not the deliberate, excessive, superfluous, mm -hmm. continual, on and on and on and on. Right. So the idea is. After this operation, we have a whole bunch of stuff written upon the tables of our heart by the Holy Ghost. So this is the whole thing. This, this story of uh, the woman taken in adultery, it's a picture of the church. And like before we come to know the Lord, or before we know God, or rather are known of God, before we answer the call of salvation, what are we subject to? We're subject to sin. We don't have power. So we're like uh, the people of the Old Testament. Uh, the people of the Old Testament, God winked at the ignorance. God did not require the fullness of, of His image, His righteous image in the flesh, performed in the flesh. He did not require that of the people of the Old Testament because the Holy Ghost was not yet given. The, only the people with the indwelling of the Holy Ghost even have the potential to come forth as Christ in the flesh, or the Word of God being manifested in your mortal body. It's like uh, the Bible says, uh, for the unrighteous, the heathen, the people who are not saved, they are not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So why expect it from it from them? It would be unrighteous. You, you have to carry the re realistic expectation that people who are not saved are not able to do what's right yeah. in the sight of God. So don't expect it from them when they're in that state. But we expect it from each other as brethren as we follow through on the operation of God. So before you've had the opportunity to have God uh, stoop down with His finger and write upon your heart your ground, He writes upon you, your ground and convinces you of sin. And then you say, oh, it's a sin, I repent. Oh, I'm a sinner, save me, Lord. And then He forgives you of your sin. And cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Yeah. In this life. Through an operation of God. Where afflictions. A baptism of afflictions. Drown out all of your old, old man's nature. And defeats it. While you and suffer in the flesh. Because of your sin. And you, you receive the taste of death. God writes that sentence of death upon you. You get a foretaste of death. A little foretaste of hell. Alienation, separation, torment. To bring you to a point of anguish and travail and godly sorrow. And when God sees the travail of your soul and the godly sorrow, then He's satisfied. Here's a heart that knows that has the sentence of death on Him. That heart has now been fashioned. The finger of God, the Holy Ghost has convinced that heart is helpless, hopeless, lost, without completely relying on the power of God to sustain him. Now he knows his sufficiency is not of himself. His sufficiency must be of God. When that counsel has been written upon the table of your heart, by the fire, by the baptism, by the afflictions... And by the influence of the Holy Ghost during all of that. Then God can impart unto you His righteousness. His power. 
so that the thing that you wanted to perform in the past but you couldn't because of the sinful flesh, God will now heal your soul. He'll deliver you from that power and He'll let that be fulfilled in you now, in your flesh, in your body. Christ can come forth in your flesh and you can manifest the image and glory of God in this present evil world like God intends. And like I say before, if Christ is now occupying your flesh and controlling the members of your particular particular members of your body, if Christ is controlling your body, will he break any of the Ten Commandments? No. That's why he told the rich young ruler, well, keep the commandments and live. Well, which ones? Pay my tithes, get circumcised, and if I see my brother's ox, pull him out of the ditch for him? Or... Nope. Not those commandments. Now, here's the ones Jesus said, you've got to keep. Don't commit adultery, don't covet, don't steal, don't lie. And what do I lack? See, so everybody, like we were saying before in the Old Testament, you had Ten Commandments on tables of stone, and they were a standard. Okay, Now, we are no longer under the law of Moses. But it doesn't mean that we're without being under a law of something. We're under a law of God. And the only difference is that not only do the Ten Commandments uh, ultimately, eventually, must be fulfilled and performed in us, in our flesh, not only that, but how is that accomplished? That is also vital and very, very important. We can't do it by self-will. But we can if we come through this operation of God. If somewhere in our experiences in our walk with God, we've had the Holy Ghost right up on our hearts and convict us of sin, and somewhere in our walk with God we've suffered affliction and baptism and fire and travail of soul and godly sorrow, and we've tasted death, and we know how devastating sin is, so sin became exceeding sinful to us, so we don't play down the consequence of sin and we realize this is why you don't covet. This is why you don't... Someone can tell me, well, you know, you shouldn't commit adultery because this and that might happen and I might say, ah, well, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. I go commit adultery. But what happens if I commit adultery and then all these things come upon me, the curse? What if they start all coming upon me? I lose all my honor, right? I lose, let's say I lose all my honor. I lose my wife, I lose my family, I lose my respect, what, uh, and uh, because I embrace adultery, and God uh, starts spreading dung on my face, and I go through all of this, well, shouldn't that make you, that's God, all those experiences are things that the Holy Ghost is going to try to take and write upon you, see, this is why, this is why, are you experiencing, are you suffering, he that's suffering in the flesh, a cease from sin. God is trying to write something there. Baptism is what saves us. God afflicting us and writing that sense of death on us and instructing us what the true devastation of sin and iniquity is to motivate godly sorrow and repentance. Now, don't make any mistake about it. The goal of this operation in this life is to stop sinning. It's that our flesh will demonstrate the righteousness of God. All right, so Jesus writes twice. The first time, of course, uh, and it, as you can see, uh, they which heard it, again he stooped and down and wrote in the ground, they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and a woman standing in the midst. And herein is sort of, again, echoing echoing the kind of the wisdom and subtlety of God in his operation. That Jesus did not have to point a finger to the scribes and the Pharisees. He simply wrote on the ground. And, uh, and as we've heard before, and I'd say rightly so, the ones who were older had enough experience that the Holy Ghost could convict, convince them of sin. And so they, they left first, starting at the eldest and ending uh, at the last. Okay, so Jesus is left alone. The woman standing in the midst, Jesus lifted up himself, saw none but the woman. Woman, where are those thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee. She said, No man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What I'm purporting here, or what I'm saying, what I'm declaring, I guess, is that this is a picture of God and the woman 
who was caught in adultery uh, is a woman who he is saying this to after the first and the second times that he stooped and wrote. So what I'm saying is, we don't even have the power of ourselves, of our self-will, to go and sin no more. But if we're Christians and we have faith in God's operation, and if we keep ourselves in that operation, and if we respond, respond to it properly, and I have an open and an honest heart between ourselves and God, as we as individuals walk and talk with God, God wants to talk to us. He wants to walk with us all as individuals. And the Holy Ghost is the finger of God. It's the Holy Ghost in you. is the Spirit that's going to get personal about you. Personal about your sin. Personal about your status with God. Personal. Finger of God. After this twofold writing, then God can say to us, go and sin no more. Because what's involved in the twofold writing is the Holy Ghost first convincing us of sin, then the Holy Ghost uh, sending us into a series of experiences to confirm His Word and confirm the sentence of death upon us that teach our heart its, its dependency, total dependency on God so we can never take credit for the righteousness that will be performed in us. Because that has to be prepared first. God, God just can't put His righteousness on us and let us go. That's what He did with Satan. And what happened to Satan? Right, He fell. So this is a preparation of heart. Prepare to meet thy God. Well, save yourself. How do you save yourselves? In this operation, we will save ourselves. Let's read from Hebrews uh, in two places. Now, of the things we have spoken, this is the sum we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. So we're talking about the, the shadow of heavenly things. Specifically, we're talking about the Ten Commandments on tables of stone being a shadow of the heavenly Thing where God is in a heavenly way, in a spiritual way, will take those Ten Commandments and write them on the tables of our heart. It involves hardship of experiences that God brings us through, the preaching of the Word of God, mixed in with the constant influence and conviction upon you personally by the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, and all those things working together preparing your heart to receive the righteousness of God until you can go and commit the sin no more. Mm. All right. So, example and shadows of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mouth. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So the first covenant was the tables of stone and all of that. And it, and it was all the system of sacrifices. And all that stuff is part of Moses' handwriting and all the ordinances and all of that. It was not faultless. It was, it, it, he, God found fault with it. It could make nothing perfect. Now, if people want to claim that we can't be made perfect in this dispensation either, then why even change the covenant? Okay, <laughs> And it's like I've always said, people say, oh, we'll all stop sinning when Jesus comes the second time. Well, Jesus has come the second time to you, you know, or whatever. He has come in the flesh. He came the first time 2,000 years ago, and His second coming to you, and this is, this is the goal, this is the mindset, this is the mark. Okay, it's a mark. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. And we are in those days now. 
I will put my laws into their mind, preaching of the word of God, and I will write them in their hearts, um, intense afflictions and experiences, experiences that your heart gets molded and moved and taught and learns by. Write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, say, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least unto the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Okay, and again in Hebrews 10, God is the Holy Ghost also is witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities I will I remember no more. Here's the important thing. When does it finally come to pass when God says, Okay, I'll remember your sins and your iniquities no more. When you have fulfilled all of this. When God has successfully written twice on the tables of your heart. Stoop down, write about your sins, and stoop down, write about uh, the sentence of death upon you and, and the experiences that teach your, you your sufficiency of God to prepare you to receive His righteousness uh, liberated in your flesh. No longer imprisoned in you, but actually liberated to come out and be manifested in your flesh. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Where the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter by the holiest, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What I'm saying is there's a depth to this story about the woman caught in adultery in the very act. Uh, it's describing a transformation, a, a redemption, then a transformation, a preparing of the heart. So the first writing convinces you of sin. The second is to cleanse you from unrighteous, all unrighteousness through the baptism of affliction. Now the baptism of affliction is the type of that in the Bible. is of course, the flood of Noah. Our old man is the old nature, the old man of the earth. The flood of afflictions drowning out the old man, drowning him out. It was after the flood that God made a covenant. Okay, it shall come to, This is the covenant I will make in those days. I will write the law in my heart. When, when is the law finally written upon the tables of your heart? After the flood. Because it's after the flood that God put his bow in the cloud and said, no longer will I destroy the earth with a flood. And Isaiah takes that imagery in Isaiah 54, verse 6. It says, For the Lord hath called thee as a woman, forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. That's your taste of death. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Alienated, separated from God, taste of death. Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man, and we have to have our little taste of death. We have to have our experience with the blessing and the curse, right? So we have the sentence of death in ourselves, the taste of death. Why? Because God's cruel? No, because it's a necessity so that we learn not to trust in ourselves or to think our sufficiencies of ourselves. That's why the sentence of death is necessary. And th that's, not, that's not a pleasant experience, but, but it's, it's something that's a necessity. So in a little wrath I hid my face, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. That's what God, that is the confirmation and the token of the covenant after the affliction, after the baptism. That's when, okay, I won't remember your sins and iniquities anymore because your sins and your iniquities have accomplished the purpose that I have wanted them to do. And as we hear other men of God expound the mystery of God's eternal purpose and how we get into the depth of the theology of the purpose of sin, that God, if you will, made man to sin or that man 
uh, committing sin is actually a necessary part of the purpose of God to give grace and mercy its opportunity and so on and so forth. But we, we split the hair on it and we really zeroed in on it to say, yes, there is a degree, a limited amount, a defined amount of sin that you must be a partaker of to find out that you are not your own, you're under the power of another, and you need to have deliverance from God. And so then you begin to put your hope in God for deliverance and lean less and less on trying to deliver yourself or, or that sort of thing. So that's necessary, isn't it? It's necessary for you to have an encounter with sin. But then we, we took the scripture in James, and I'll say it again, lay apart all superfluity of naughtiness or sin. There is an excess amount of sin that is not is no longer serving the purpose of grace. It's actually transgressing grace. Mm -hmm. It's an extra, excessive amount of sin that you're involving yourself with. And it's the excess of sin, the superfluity of naughtiness, is characterized by the deliberation of the will, the presumptuous spirit, presuming that you can sin in such a way that you deliberate the sin. You, it's provisional sin, and it goes on continuously in excess, where now grace is misconstrued to the point where it sears the conscience. The grace of God turned into lasciviousness, as though it's okay to pursue the unbridled lust. Your sin, your sin can be forgiven if you slip and sin while you're trying to bridle it in the fear of God, and discovering that you can't do it by yourself, and it makes you cry out to God, well, that's okay. But not the unbridled lust, the carefully nonchalant, at every, at every turn, at every corner, create as multiple, many opportunities as you can to sin. We, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play that counsel like a, <laughs> like a broken record. Because that is the crux of the matter of how grace has turned in our generation to be exploited, misused, transgressed, etc. All right. Um, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, this is when the forgiveness of sin comes. This is when the declaration of God. Okay, I won't impute your sins and your trespasses because you are maintaining yourself in the operation of God. You are enduring afflictions. You are embracing the performance and the expression of my holiness and you are trying to do it and you're finding out you just can't do it as easy as you think. And you can't do it just because you want. Yeah. But you are embracing it. You know, in the spirit of my mind, I delight after the law of God. After the inward man. But excessive uh, provisional sin means that you are uh, delighting in the unrighteousness. Okay, that's not acceptable. All right, once you come through the operation of God like that, God has written on your heart, then he can go and say, go and sin no more. I mean, I always use the uh, smoking example because it's, it's kind of a neutral thing. It doesn't offend anybody and it makes the point. Well, I smoke cigarettes, right? And I couldn't quit smoking by myself. But I knew it was wrong and I embraced that I should keep my temple holy and I should not defile it with cigarettes. And I embraced that and I believed that and I feared that. And it's by that fear that I tried to depart from that activity. And I found out it had control over me. It had a power over me. And it, and it brought me to a cry. It brought me to a travail. If, I, if, uh, if something doesn't happen, this thing's going to take me down. I'm going to defile the temple. God's going to destroy me. What am I going to do? Right? I didn't say, oh, we're covered by grace. Give me another smoke. You know? I didn't walk down to buy 10 packs and you know, line up my next pack for, for just in case this one runs out. I didn't do that. Okay, well, you see my point, right? And then I get to this climax of a cry in my heart, and I guess it's the time that, that, that God knows the heart. He sees, okay, now he knows, and now his heart's been prepared. Now when I deliver him, he'll know it's my power, and he couldn't do it himself. Now it's safe to, to empower him not to smoke, and he won't think it's himself, and I'll get the glory, <laughs> right? And so that's what happened. Right after that great cry came out of me, I went to a, a Pentecostal service and the Holy Ghost came upon me and I had clear witness I would never smoke again and I never smoked again. No withdrawals, I didn't have to try, anything like that. So then after all of that, that was God writing up upon the table of my heart. First thing he wrote was, 
he took, he took the Holy Ghost. Now, no one told me this. It was the Holy Ghost within me, the finger of God, taking the word of God and saying, hey, you shouldn't smoke because you're defiling your temple. And him that defiles the temple, God shall destroy. And the Holy Ghost was writing out on my heart, stooped down and he wrote in sand. So if someone else came and smoked, I would no longer be able to point the finger at them and condemn them because I'm a smoker, right? So if I wanted to charge someone else, you know, with a, what, whatever, after this experience, you're the temple and you defile the temple, God will destroy you and I try to quit and I can't quit. Well, now I'm not going to be able to easily charge anybody else. You see, when the woman's taken into adultery, the scribes and the Pharisees catch her in the very act. These are men that are not spirit-filled. It's like I say, they're trying to catch Jesus. What's Jesus going to do? Can we catch him? We know what he should do according to the law of Moses. Couldn't care less about the woman in adultery. Couldn't care less about Jesus. Couldn't care less about the glory of God or the perfection of the saints or the welfare of the woman in adultery. But now, we as the church, we have been illuminated. We, we have received revelation. We have been enlightened, right? We have some of the secrets of God has been revealed to us and we know the mystery of God, what His will is and how righteousness is to come to pass being performed in us. So when we judge, we are using the law also. And the law is good. The law is spiritual. That's another thing. In Romans, Paul said the law is spiritual. Moses' handwriting of ordinances were carnal. There's another distinction. Why is the law spiritual? Because it was written with the finger of God, which is the spirit of God. The law is spiritual. So if the law is spiritual and Christ is in you, he will fulfill the law. <laughs> and if, if the law is not being fulfilled in you, then you are still under the power of Satan. And you have yet to fulfill this operation. All unrighteousness is sin. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Sin meaning more than just unbelief. We're talking about demonstration actions of unrighteousness. I have some stuff in here. Maybe I'll get to it. Let's go to Ezekiel, th Ezekiel 33. So the woman... You see the point here? When Jesus says, go and sin no more. When Jesus finally delivered me from cigarettes. And he turned to me and said, go and sin no more. Now, he didn't actually say it in those exact words. But I had a witness in me. Now, there you go. Go and be free from smoking cigarettes like you desired for so long and couldn't do it. Go ahead and be smoke free. Right? Go and sin no more like your desire was. <laughs> well, who's going to... Stop sinning if their desire is, is to commit sin. Yeah. That's why I say the prolonged uh, continuance of sinning a particular sin, eventually you're just going to say to God, I love this darkness. Yeah. No, it's like, oh yeah, sins are forgiven and everything else, but like, like we say, if you're in the operation of God though, and you're embracing true holiness, and that's another thing, people who embrace true holiness are inevitably going to be called legalists. Because if you embrace true holiness, the true holiness of God, being demonstrated and manifested, and Christ be glorified in your body, okay, and the body is for the Lord, and that Christ may be manifest in our mortal bodies, and that you yield your members of your bodies as servants to do the deeds of righteousness. If you're going to do all that, well, then... Uh, uh, we're, we're to embrace all of that. The woman caught in adultery at the end of all of that, Jesus stooping and writing twice with his finger, at the end it's just me and Jesus. And Jesus is telling me, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Go and commit adultery no more. It's not a generalized instruction, meaning that, uh, oh, just go and every time you sin, just come back to me. No, it's actually specifically telling her, go and commit adultery no more. Because there's hidden in that story is the fulfillment of God's writing on the tables of your heart. Now, and then after that operation, that's when God says to you, like at the end of the Noah's flood, okay, I was mad at you for a while and I was wroth and I was showing you trembling and fearfulness and horror of, the, of what happens when you commit sin and you... You know, 
you were running around, like me. I was running around fearful that my I was defiling the temple. Is God going to defile me? I was experiencing a taste of the potential wrath of God. And then when the, finally, when the waters of affliction came out upon me, it was all over. Now, I'm delivered. Go and sin no more. Now, this is like the waters of Noah to me, God will say. I will no longer be wroth with you. Your sins and your iniquities, I'm not going to remember them. No. Now, Ezekiel 33, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. And again, anyone who operates as a watchman like this in any capacity and warns about impending judgment of God that he sees, that God shows him, inevitably someone is going to call him a condemner. Oh, see, you just condemn. Oh, you're just throwing the law at me. No, just remember, the law is still in use during the dispensation of grace. And the law is good. It's just. It's good. It's spiritual. And it's good if a man uses the law lawfully. The law is not for a righteous man. The law is for the sinner and the ungodly and the profane and the man-stealer and the whoremonger and the, anything that's contrary to the sound doctrine of, of pursuing the purity and holiness of God in our lives, in our flesh. Anything that's contrary to that doctrine, that's what the law is for. It's for that. Okay, so if you're profane, if you're perverse, if you're an adulteress, if you're a whoremonger, if you're this, if you're that then even in the dispensation of grace, the law can become a tool. You can preach that law to support the fear of God, to facilitate the operation of God. It's just that we don't use the law and trust in it alone to produce the righteousness. But the law is still there to define the righteousness, to give a counsel, preaching, doctrine, scripture, to put it forth, and uh, uh, magnify it in the conscience of God's people so that the finger of God, the Holy Ghost, can emphasize conviction to the individual. Well, then it's lawful. Now, we're not trusting in the law to bring forth righteousness, but what do you do with that? The law is, is just, it's holy, it's good if a man use it lawfully. So this is a lawful use of the, of the law. Anything contrary to sound doctrine? Now, this is New Testament. This is New Testament scripture and counsel. I'm not, not Old Testament. Right. The New Testament says, somebody's walking contrary to sound counsel and doctrine. They're the whatever, perverse, and all those things. That, the law is for you then. You want to insist on walking in perversion? The law is for you. Don't complain if God puts it on another man, man's heart to, to magnify the law about that activity or anything else. <clears throat> Okay, I'm not putting you under the law. You're putting yourself under the curse of the law mm. by your actions. Talk no more exceeding proudly, not, not arrogancy come out of your mouth in the prayer of Hannah. Remember that? For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by Him actions are weighed. Now, we're going to talk about that. Actions and deeds and... Uh, fruit meat for repentance is not your own self-righteous works. That's another thing. Perversions of grace will try to characterize the true required fruit meat for repentance, and they'll try to tag that as, oh, that's your self-righteousness. No, it's not self-righteousness. It is fruit meat for repentance. It is the description of the, the necessary things and changes in your actions and life that must come to pass, fulfill true godly repentance. Again, it's important how those things come to pass. It can't come to pass by self-will. But nevertheless, there are things that have to come to pass that constitute uh, repentance, which are uh, the fruit meat for repentance. Fruit being the actions that you have to take to show God that you're repenting. All right, if he... The watchman sees the sword coming. He blows the trumpet and warns the people. Whosoever hears the sound and takes not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet 
and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And this is the tightrope of every watchman. Am I just throwing the law at him? Am I just speaking condemnation out there? Or do I actually have an unction and a perception from the Holy Ghost, and I see the righteous judgment of God impending, looming, imminent on upon an individual or people or a situation, and being moved by fear and godly charity. I'll put myself on the line, and I'll blow the trumpet, and I'll give this warning. Hey, man, you're transgressing grace. This is not a sin of the flesh. Or Balaam's ass, see? Balaam's ass saw the impending judgment, saw the angel of the Lord pull a sword on the prophet. You know, it's because the prophet was perverse. We said that before, Balaam, your ways is perverse before me, God said. And even anoints the dumb ass to rebuke the prophet. Well, we've heard that. No one sent here to correct me or rebuke me. Well, well I don't, maybe most of the time, maybe not. All right, but once in a while, when things get really... Out of, out of sorts. and So anyway, the watchman always uh, walks that tightrope. So, son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Shalt, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Wow, you know, that's... When I speak to warn... The wicked to return from his way. The word way means his course of life. His mode of actions. All right. His conversation or his lifestyle. His journey. His manner of life. That's what way means. I'm trying to emphasize and take the idea of wickedness and unbelief. To constitute, those terms constitute things that are way beyond just what you think or what you believe in your mind and spirit. We're talking about actions and courses and deeds and changing what you do and how you live. And just because I say that doesn't mean I'm prov promoting my own personal standard that you have to keep. Because I'm not saying that, right? That this is the scriptures and I'm preaching by the Holy Ghost if you receive it and if you believe it. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel, thus you speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away them, how should we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways." Why will you die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. See that? So if you're going to continue on in sin, with no particular intentions of stopping, through whatever false counsels you're embracing, however your conscience has been seared to think that you can do that, if you continue in your way, then all the things you did righteous in the past, they're not going to deliver you. You can scramble for every good memory of anything God did for you in the past. And Ezekiel says, no, that's not going to suffice. So righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sins. Now this always reminded me of Jeremiah. When Jeremiah said, at what instant, at what instant I shall speak concerning a people or a nation or a land. At what instant I shall speak that I am going to you know, judge them and destroy them. At what instant they turn and repent. And bethink themselves and go the other way. At what instant they do that, then I will also repent from the evil that I thought to do unto them. Right? I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the scripture here. Likewise, in the day, at what instant a nation or a person or, you know, or a land, 
at what instant they shall turn from doing what's right and do what's unlawful and wicked, that God, I will repent of all the goodness and blessing that I said that I would do to them. Now I've given you both scenarios. Now, return, Israel. Return. Amend your ways and your doings. Bring forth fruit, actions, changes in the course of your life that bring forth fruit meat for repentance. Actions and deeds is what God is weighing. Because the actions and the deeds are the overflow of what's already in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit. That's what the fruit is, is what you do. We have to emphasize that. Because there's been a lot of contrary emphasis, emphasis to the contrary. That is the perception that holds people in their uh, state of seared consciousness. Holds them in a blindness to think they can continue their present course or what have you. When I say to the righteous, he shall surely live. If he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses <laughs> shall not be remembered. But for the iniquity that he committeth, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed. If he walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Right? At what instant that he turns? Yet the children of thy people say, The way of the Lord is not equal. In other words, God isn't being fair. As for them, their way is not equal. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Yet you say, The way of the Lord is not equal, O house of Israel. I will judge you, everyone, after his ways. We define the word ways, even though you almost think you would have to, but I did anyway. And it came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, and the fifth day of the month, the one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me, saying, The city is smitten. Now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening, afore that he was escaped came, and had opened my mouth and until he came to me in the morning, and my mouth was opened, and I was no more dumb. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Remember, this is the same chapter that talks about the watchman, and about righteousness and wickedness. And you could be righteous all, a whole bunch of righteousness in, in the past, but if you're still doing wickedness and iniquity, you can't turn to the, any of that past stuff. It's not going to deliver you. You still have to turn, <clears throat> right? Amen. And likewise, if you're, wick, if you're in wickedness and you turn and do what's lawful and right, then none of the wickedness in the past then will be right. remembered. Mm -hmm. But it requires fruit meat for repentance. It requires certain actions. So then the word came, this is the same in the same chapter. Son of man, they that inhabit those waste places, uh, wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is given us for inheritance. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, You eat with the blood, you lift up your eyes towards your idols, and you shed blood, shall you possess the land? You stand upon your sword, you, you try to uh, advance your status or maintain your status or your face before everybody, by, by the use of the sword. You stand upon your sword. There's another scripture that talks about men of God using force. And God reproves them and says, Your force is not right. We heard Brother Stair say, America is, lives by the bomb, right? Their sword is the bomb. They live by everyone being afraid of the bomb. Every, all the rest of the world for a long time had been under this yoke of fear. Well, you can do that. As a minister, ministers can do that. They can use the sword of God as an instrument of ungodly fear even upon others to try to get them to submit to ungodly acts. So a man of God's ungodly agenda is standing by a sword. He, you stand by your sword. By the use of force. By the use of authority of the sword. You're standing in your evil by the use of the sword. Your force is not right. You work abomination, you defile every one his neighbor's wife, and shall you possess the land? Say thou thus unto them, Thus saith the Lord God as I live, They that are in the waste shall fall by the sword, and him that is in the open field I will give to the beast to be devoured, and they that be in the forts 
and in the cave shall die of the pestilence. I'll lay the land desolate, and none shall pass through. Then shall they know that I am the Lord when I have laid the land most desolate because of all of their abominations which they have committed. And then that scripture goes for anybody that God puts in a watchman status. Whether you're a watchman to a particular <clears throat> group of people, or whether you're a watchman to a whole bunch of people, or to the whole church, or whatever. People are, God raises up watchmen in various capacities, and different degrees, and different levels, different levels of uh, ministry, and everything else. Son of man, the children of thy people are still talking against thee by the walls, and in the doors of the houses, and speak one another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that comes from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people come, but they sit before thee as my people. They hear thy words, but they will not do them, for they're with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. <clears throat> Lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear their words, but they do not, they do them not. When this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. I have to say something here. Everybody knows I'm not a prophet, but everybody should know <clears throat> That anybody in a uh, ministering position of oversight, according to Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, those New Testament offices, every one of them is a higher ranking office than Old Testament prophet. Every one of them. He that is born of women, John the Baptist, of those born of women, there's not a greater than John the Baptist, but he that is born of the Holy Ghost, he that is least in the kingdom, is greater than John the Baptist. Okay, so I'm basically, well, trying to sound my own horn, I'm qualifying myself as a, as a watchman. I've seen enough, I've sought enough, I have enough witness, I've been preaching long enough, I've been a Christian long enough, that I know when I see impending judgment and I'm issuing a warning, I am not a condemner. I am not a self-righteous man. I bring forth what I have seen and heard from the Lord. I am not a. <clears throat> I'm not issuing a standard of my own righteousness for others to follow. I think I expounded enough. If you listen to me long enough, you'll 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 realize that. So, by mercy and truth, iniquity is. Purged, purged, purged. That means pushed and displaced completely out of you. Yes. Mind, soul, body, and spirit. And that's because as Christ comes forth, you know, there's not there's not room for the darkness comprehended it. Not. It gets purged, it gets purged right out of your flesh. It drives you out. It, Jesus Christ coming forth in your flesh destroys the works of the devil in your flesh. There's not room for the two. It gets per you actually get a spiritual deliverance. I remember uh, my earliest days, encounters with the Holy Ghost, getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. As the Holy Ghost filled me, I screamed and I cried and with these awful shrieks and wails and things I would never heard myself cry before. It almost spooked me out a bit that the, these kind of cries were coming out of me. And I said, Lord, what happened? I went home and I opened the Bible to the book of Acts. It fell open and it said, And unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed. So what happened? The Holy Spirit came in and the unclean spirits were purged out. Nowhere else to go. You know how purging is, right? You have a cup of dirty water. You pour the clean water in. It pushes the dirt out. Because it has the glass can only contain so much. Well, that's purged. Purged means it doesn't dwell in you anymore. You don't have the potential to do it anymore. That's purged. Mercy and truth. Iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. By the fear of the Lord. Again, this is the proper use of the Lord to promote godly fear, to sting the conscience. You know, you're, there has to be an effect. There has to be a sting in your conscience. With uh, the word of God, especially if you're committing sin, there should be some kind of discomfort in your conscience. So something that you feel. Now I'm in 1 John chapter 1, starting verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And 
truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him. And declare unto you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, is covetousness darkness? Is being a thief darkness? Is being a man stealer darkness? Is adultery darkness? Is lying darkness? If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk, commit the acts and deeds of unrighteousness and darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And we swear we are of God, but we swear falsely. God is going to reprove the false swearers. How can a man stand and say, commit adultery and then say, I am not controlled by a spirit of lust. <laughs> How can you say that? Then you're, a li you're lying. Sure. Another man may say, they're saying I am, a, I am perverse. They're saying I'm a thief. I'm saying I'm an alcoholic beer drinker. Well, it's all a lie. Well, is it a lie if you're still drinking the beer? And so I'll, I'll even give the benefit of the doubt. I'll say, okay, then it's a lie. You're not a beer drinker. You're not a habitual, excessive beer drinker. It's a lie. But my next question is going to be, how long do you intend to love and make this lie? See what I'm getting at? The Word of God is not going to... Let us go. We're not going to get out of it. Any of us. Conviction is conviction. You can't circumvent it. Lie all you want to. Assert yourself. You're not, you can't get out of conviction. You can't get out of what's required. Fruit meet for repentance. It's required. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn, which means despise or scorn, Wherefore does the wicked contemn God, or God's ways, or God's word, or God's requirement? Wherefore, why does the wicked despise it? Because God says, it is required. We're not speaking standards of men. We are speaking the things that constitute uh, fruit, meat for repentance. And we are speaking the things that of a necessity are required. If you do these things, you shall die. So you have fellowship with him, huh? But you walk in darkness, then we lie. And we do not do the truth. Not think the truth, believe the truth, embrace the truth, read about the truth. Do the truth. Are you with me? Everybody with me on that? That's the truth now. Sounds like to some like I'm promoting self-righteousness, but it's just not so. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't separate the two. It's a twofold scripture. He forgives us and then he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And again, what's the condemnation? Some act and deed of sin? No, the, un the uh, condemnation comes when you love rather than the light. When all the opportunities have been presented. It's like the people of the Old, uh, Old Testament. They never had opportunity to have the empowerment of the Holy Ghost and to overcome in their flesh bodies like we do. Even us before we're saved, we never had the opportunity to walk in righteousness. We never had the empowerment. We're in ignorance. God winked at it. We got saved, got filled with the Holy Ghost. We got baptized in water for the remissions of sins passed mm -hmm. through the forbearance of God. Now, after that, we walk according to a new law. Behold, I send an angel, the Holy Ghost. Now I send an angel. He's going to walk and talk with you personally. Beware of him. Don't provoke him. Obey his voice, because he will not pardon your transgressions. Because it's a spiritual thing now. So if you, you, you miss 
or, or you miss the voice of the Holy Ghost or you disobey the Holy Ghost, there's going to be a consequence. Mm-hmm. And for us as Christians, if we're under the benefits of God, then He will put mercy and truth in there and He'll cause it to um, give us instruction in our hearts. Mm-hmm. You know, He'll use it to fashion our hearts rather than to destroy us with it. Sure. But nevertheless, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, past tense, we make Him a liar mm-hmm. and His word is not in us. And personally, I don't know too many Christians that that are guilty of that. Most of the people I know will easily confess, yeah, we have sinned you know, in the past. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not, as we said earlier. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Do we begin again in 2 Corinthians 3, 1, 2, and 3? I want, just wanted to add this in a little off, off of the present topic, which goes back to something I said early, earlier. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistles, written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Ghost, the finger of God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So you see, Paul's taking the whole uh, writing of Ten Commandments on Mount Horeb, and he's saying that's an allegory of how God is going to take his Holy Ghost, his finger, and he's going to write on the tables of your heart. And remember, the work of God writing the the commandments on tables of stone was glorious. Which is something that he was going to just do away with. How much more glorious will it be when he writes it on the table of our hearts? And remember, the whole episode was, was so dramatic that I think Moses said, I exceeding fear and quake because of the dramatic work of God writing those commandments on the tables of stone. Remember, it was a fiery finger of God. It was a very dramatic and uh, intense experience. The reason I'm saying that is because, you know, that's what we have to, we have to endure some of that to get the impact of God writing His laws upon the tables of our heart. And like I say, once He writes that law on the table of our hearts, then we perform righteousness from within. Yeah. And that's and that's the chief difference between law, the dispensation of law, and the dispensation of grace. In the dispensation of law, there was a series of laws that were imposed upon them from without. It's, it's rules, regulations, laws imposed upon you from without until the time of reformation. The goal of the New Testament age of grace is for God to write the laws in your heart and then the laws come up from within, right? And that becomes a divine nature, a natural fulfillment of the law. Either way, it's fulfilled. It's like we say, a man uh, may uh, a- a- attain to the righteousness of God by going through this operation and walking with Jesus and finally coming to the place where he gets free from a sin or various sins or so on and so forth. And because of that, he no longer smokes or he no longer commits adultery. It is the righteousness of God doing that. Okay, And it's required. It's required. Not when Jesus comes a second time, but in this present world, right? Mm-hmm. Resurrection power is here now. There will be another man who is not even a Christian, and just by his self-will, he stops smoking or he stops committing adultery. So you have two men that don't commit adultery, but one of them is his own righteousness. The other one's the righteousness of Christ. Mm-hmm. So the guy in his own righteousness is not going to count for him. He's not going to enter the kingdom of God that way. Right. Yeah. But now on the other side, you have a man who, who, uh, what I say? I said now you have a man who does commit adultery, and he is a heathen, and he never gets saved. Well, he'll die in his sin. He'll die for committing adultery. Let's say he's a whoremonger or something. Then you have a man who is a Christian who is a whoremonger and commits adultery, but he never follows through on the operation of God and he just keeps committing, keeps committing, keeps committing, 
keeps committing, sears his conscience, and it never stops. Well, that man's not entering in either. You understand? And the whole point of what I'm saying is you only have like four categories of people like that. But no matter how you cut this pie, it is required. And you have to embrace and hold this embrace that it's re required. We embrace producing this holiness of God in our mortal bodies. How it is achieved and how it is, of con how it is accomplished is also of vital importance to make sure that it is the righteousness of God. But nevertheless, it's like I told you about Brother Glenn's vision of Jesus on the cross, suffering in total agony, and, and in his vision he could sense and feel the, the, the pain and agony of Christ, and he was, he was beside himself, he, he couldn't handle seeing the Lord. He said, Lord, what can we do to stop that agony? How, how do we stop you in all your agony, bearing all that agony? And the Lord said, stop sinning. So, when we sin, we put agony on the body of Christ, right? He's still bearing agony, maybe not as a high priest in heaven, but the body of Christ. Somehow we bear all that, and his spirit is in us, so in a way he's bearing it by being in us again. Yeah. So we're only talking about the necessity uh, of things. You know, I don't. we don't celebrate Christmas, or most of us here, I guess. I'm assuming we don't. Yeah, none of us do, I don't think. And uh, as I said before, I could say, well, Jonathan, why don't you celebrate Christmas? I could say, well, I, it's against my religion. They, they told me that, that we don't do it, and so it just, you know, right? That's kind of meaningless, really. Oh, you don't eat pork, why? Well, I don't, just my religion says we don't eat pork. We, we eat fish on Fridays. My religion says that. It's a, kind of an empty thing. There's not much worship in it. There's not much understanding in it, Right? But if I know the purpose of God and I say, oh my goodness, you know, the devil, we see historically the devil established counterfeits of Christianity and blended pagan elements and polluted the worship of Christianity in 325 AD, uh, Constantine in the Council of Nicaea and it became the Roman Catholic Church and it's a great counterfeit and it's really serving to deceive many people and da, 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 da. well that's why i don't because i know i have the understanding you see there's some right. substance in it there's some depth of it yeah. and I, I have been convinced of something mm -hmm. and i personally understand god's mind on it mm -hmm. the holy ghost has worked with the council of god and with the council of historical facts of religion mm -hmm. and it's convinced me convinced me it's now written on my heart He's convinced me that this is a motion of evil that's against God by Satan. And this is of necessity we have to remove ourselves because we can't worship God in vain. We must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And you know, Christmas is a lie. And you can go on and on and on and on, right? Well, that's something a little bit more substantial and more like the righteousness of God than just to say, oh, it's against my religion. You know, why, why do you not commit adultery? I don't know. The Bible says don't commit it. Yeah. Well, that's no good. What if you go and commit adultery and your whole life gets turned upside down and your lifestyle is destroyed and full of dishonor and, and you reap all of this calamity and destruction upon your life? Shouldn't the Holy Ghost be able to talk to you personally and say, you see why it's a necessity that you must be faithful? And do you see what happens when unfaithfulness comes into a marriage? What will unfaithfulness do in the kingdom of God, in the spiritual adultery? So if you can't be faithful in the natural, who, who says you'll ever be able to be faithful in the spiritual? If you can't love your brother who you see, how in the world are you going to love God who you can't see? How are you going to say, I'm not faithful to my wife, but I'm faithful to God? How are you going to say that? Because the one is the expression of the other. And that's not just adultery, as we know. Any sin is unfaithfulness. You adulterers and you adulteresses, you're friends with the world. You're a, a spiritual adulterer. But, okay, so let's take it out of the sexual realm just in terms of the idea of faithfulness. What God is trying to say in all of that is... This is why it's a necessity to cultivate faithfulness in everything. This is not just a good idea. This is a necessity. Without faithfulness in eternity, 
It'll be corruption in eternity. And just like you experience destruction in your life through physical adultery or spiritual adultery here, that's what, you, that's, that's what would happen in eternity. God is trying to write. Now, this is a necessity. We're not condemning anybody here. These, these are the necessities. These, this is the sword of God coming on us. Watch me when you see the sword come. Blow the trumpet. And again, confession of sins. I'm all for the confession of sins and the forgiveness of sins. But if you want to put this together with a lot of other things I've been saying lately, I talked about when do you um, remit sins, when do you retain them, when is iniquity imputed, and when is iniquity covered, and, and those sorts of things. When it's when guile is there, when the deliberation is there, when provisional things are there. And uh, two writings. Take it back to the woman in adultery. Again, the scribes and the Pharisees are, are judging in their carnality and their religiosity. It doesn't mean that we can't judge. Because what we're doing is we're, we're making evaluations and judgments about the state of the church and the state of people's mindsets concerning grace and law and mercy and truth. Oh, that's what I was going to say. I was going to say, uh, so people think that the confession of sins, I'm all for the confession and the forgiveness of sins, but you cannot promote the confession of sin as the only criteria. Okay, so people are, advo- are promoting the confession of sin as though that's the finishing line. The race is over. I confess my sin, the race is over. No. And that's why I said we confess our sins, then we have to go on to be purged, cleansed from all unrighteousness. So the confession is you at the starting blocks. You confess your sins. <clears throat> the gun goes off. Now run the race. Enter into the operation of God. Now God is going to purge, cleanse and purge you from all unrighteousness. And then when Christ comes forth in your flesh and you no longer commit that sin, that's the finishing line. Okay, so confession of sin is not the finishing line. It's the starting blocks. Yeah, and so we've heard people promote confession as though it's the, the end of the race. Well, that's nothing more than Catholic confession. Right. Or dressed up. All right, that's it. I'm done. God bless you.